Good morning, superhumans. Okay, so very first thing I'm going to do a little audio test. Well, my audio test uh, for now is I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and to Aboriginal elders and peoples from other communities who may be taking part in this live stream today. Now, we need an audio test because uh, this is the first time I've tried with this particular radio microphone going into OBS and I'm seeing the audio jumping around a whole lot. Oh, Peter, hey, good to see you. Um, and <laughs> sorry about the music giving you a shock. And it looks like it might be really noisy, but I don't know. I think your shirt is making noise. Yes, it could be. Um, we'll see what happens. The problem is that today I've got to be moving around a whole lot, which means that uh, the microphone that is just at the computer is probably not going to be the best thing. A bit flat muted. Does not reverb the room. Okay. Uh, part of the slight buzz might be the... All right. I know this is kind of a bit silly to be doing this messing around on camera, but I am going to try switching to a different microphone plugged into this one. So, uh, we'll see if this makes it better. I assume you can still hear me at the moment. <clears throat> yes, this is all just making it up as I go. So, Oh, come on. Get that out. And get that out of the way. Okay. So at the moment, I'm wearing a body pack microphone. And it's probably not the best way to be doing it. Alright, so. I'm going to hit mute for a second because I'm about to plug in a little lapel mic into the body pack and it's probably going to make a bunch of noise while I'm doing it. But first I've got to find my cursor. There it is. Okay, here goes silent mode. Actually, yes, James's suggestion is to try that. I'm going to take that. I'll just clip it on here and see how that goes. Maybe I'll clip it on lower down. We'll try there. All right, that probably made, <laughs> that probably made a whole bunch of noise and annoyed you while I was doing it. Oh well, no more scratchy when you move. Yes, all right. So I think next time I'm trying to use this microphone, I'm gonna use the lapel mic plugged into the microphone pack. So, uh, okay, what I'm going to do today is assemble an updated Etheruno prototype. Uh, hello from Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, oh, unexpected, Sion. So what's the mic? It looks cool. It is a Rode, what is it? Rode Go, I think. It's, um, in fact, in a second, I can show you the receiver. So right now you are looking through my, my main camera. I'm gonna to switch to the poker phone. So now we've got a portable camera as well. And the receiver, whoop, now I'm making you all seasick. So there you can see my main camera and you can see the little receiver that is stuck on the top of the camera. That's the road receiver and the transmitter basically looks the same. So it's like size of a box of matches or something. It's got a built-in microphone and it's also got a thing where you can plug in an external lapel microphone. Uh, the really nice thing about this is that it's got USB-C on both the transmitter and the receiver and it's got a LiPo battery in it which in theory should give me about five or six hours of life, which is a huge improvement on the other radio mic, which had two double A's in it, and it would go really flat. 
uh, it would go flat really fast. And because what I really don't like about using radio mics with regular batteries is if you can't begin an event with a battery that isn't full because you don't know how long it's going to last. So typically what happens is you end up pulling out the batteries and replacing them right before you start every single thing. All right. Um, yes, <laughs> fix the camera view. Okay, so today is going to be uh, a little bit strange because a lot of this I'm going to have to be focusing on and it's going to be a little bit hard for me to follow what you're talking about. I've got, um, oh, pancake, you're here, awesome. I've got a tablet over here so that I can uh, hopefully see, hang on, can I unlock it? Yes. So I can see the feedback uh, coming in from Andy on the back channel. All right, so let's start with applying a bit of solder paste. And I was hoping to have a whole lot of things organized in advance of the live stream. So just before this live stream started, what I did was pull out some old boards. You can see some old donor boards here. These are old ones that have failed for whatever reason. Oh, dead PSU and Ethernet. So, you know, scrap boards, whatever. And I went through and pulled off a bunch of parts. Things like resistor networks and uh, voltage regulators and a couple of other odds and ends. Uh, there are some inductors here. These are parts that I don't have uh, ready to go. So, like as new. So, what I've done is just stripped a whole bunch of them off old boards. And then I can populate them onto the new one. So, some of the parts we're going to populate using the pick and place machine. And some of the parts I will just migrate over. So things like, I even grabbed a, an 18 mega 16 u 2 So this one's already got the, uh, the USB to serial thing preloaded into it, so it saves flashing it. There's a CPU, 18 mega 328 voltage regulators, grabbed a card cage. These things are really hard to get off without damaging them. They're very annoying because they've got this big plastic base on them. When you heat them up, the base just tends to melt, so you've got to be very careful with it. So I used my PCB preheater. I wonder if I can get this across into the field of view. Well, if I take off the power cable, I can. So I used this, which is my PCB preheater. It's very, very cool. It's basically a heater in the box. It blows hot air out the top here. And these are magnetic board mounts. So what you can do is take a donor board like this one and you just pop it in between those two mounts so that it's over the area where it says hot surface and you can see there that it's suspended over the heater outlet oops it slid and then if this was actually plugged in what I could do is turn it on you can adjust the temperature of the heat output and you can have it in hot or cool mode so what you do is put the board on top of this and you just turn on the heat let it sit there for a a couple of minutes and what happens is the whole board heats up and it doesn't heat up enough to melt the solder this is not for reflow this is just for bringing the temperature of the board up to the point where it's close to uh, to melting the solder and then I grab the hot air bring it down and then you just warm up the, the particular area of the board where you want to get the parts off and then the solder uh, melts and you can lift the parts off. So the idea is that doing this is better for a few reasons. One is that it brings the whole board up to a certain temperature. Instead of having a very intense heat in a certain area, if you start with a room temperature board, there are parts of the board that are going to be at you know 20 or 25 degrees or whatever your room temperature is, and parts of the board that are going to be at 300 degrees. So it can put mechanical stress across the board if you bring the entire board up to uh, up to something that's below melting, like say you bring it up to 120 or 140 degrees, 
then when you heat up specific parts of it to remove or rework those areas, there is less thermal differential across the board. So you get less mechanical stress uh, because of expansion and contraction and less thermal shock because the temperature is not changing as rapidly as you heat those parts up. Oh look, we're chasing squirrels already. I thought I was going to be assembling boards today, but um, let's see. Oh, I just saw there was a question from Mike Causa, removed with hot air gun. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of already answering that question. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I went a long, long time without a board preheater. I've had this one for a couple of years now, but it's one of those things that I'd heard about as being cool and worthwhile. And I, um, but, you know, there are some tools that until you've used them, you don't understand the value of them because you just don't have any reference or, yeah. It's that thing, if you've used it, then you understand how good it can be. So, where is that PCB? Over here. I stuck it on the pick and place machine, which we will get back to in a while. But first, we need some paste. Now, I'm going to try to keep track of questions and keep talking while I'm applying paste, but this is not exactly a spectator sport. And also, I don't have um, I don't have a stencil for this. So in production, of course, you would use a solder paste stencil to apply all of the solder paste. Now, one thing that's a little bit strange is that the field of view of what you can see through this camera is a lot smaller than the field of view that I have. So I've got to I'm going to have to work to keep the uh, the PCB visible under the camera by trying to keep everything in the center. So I'm just gonna sit here and squirt on some solder. Now, question is, what can I talk about while I'm doing this that is not going to be too much of a problem and stop me from, uh, from being able to do this properly? I don't know. Let's see. Um, doo -doo. What is that part? I don't know. Oh, that must be the fuse. Is it? It seems to be on the wrong side. Oh, no, that's right. The fuse ended up moving. I'm holding the board upside down at the moment. So the um, my perspective on it is all twisted. But the, the poly fuse... Now, this is the bit on the, the part on the board that I hate the most. It's a QFN. Now, doing this with a stencil is pretty easy. Doing this with a little syringe like this is kind of annoying. Getting the right amount of solder paste out onto it and uh, trying to get it so that it will reflow without bridges. Now, you'll see that many of these pads don't have any connections to them. And so you might be wondering why I'm bothering to put solder paste on those pads. The reason is that if you don't, surface tension can end up pulling the chip out of alignment. So uh, if you have pads that are pasted on one side of the chip and not on the other, the surface tension will end up floating the board in that particular direction and it can end up skewing. So you can see, for example, down this side of the chip, there are many pads here that just don't have any connections. It's only the pads on the end that are connected, but I've put a bit of solder paste on them anyway. Uh, and I also do the same thing on this. So this is the USB-C connector. And the other thing is that I could just run a bead of solder straight down across all of these pads. That's what I used to do, and recently I've started putting paste directly on each pad like this. And it's all going to smoosh together when it reflows anyway, so I'll just squirt a bit in here that'll give it a bit of mechanical mount. I'm going to use a soldering iron, and oh, that's interesting. That slot is shorter. I wonder if that's going to fit. 
Oh well, we'll see when we get to it. So when I put the socket on, what I'll do is put the socket on and it's going to be reflowed in the oven, but then I'm going to use the, uh, the hand soldering iron and uh, I'll make sure that it's properly soldered anyway for mechanical strength. So I've just put a bit of the solder paste into the mechanical holes for the USB socket so that when it does, does go through the oven it'll have a bit to hold it in place. Now one of the changes for this version of the board see that one there that's a diode is it in your field of view? Yes it is. And somewhere around there's another there it is there's another diode. So there was some discussion on Discord uh, about two weeks ago now. It was after I showed a previous version of this and uh, there was a discussion about isolating the power source from you know the power over Ethernet power source so that it couldn't be back powered. And it's something that I didn't do on the Ether 10 and in fact the Ether Mega, the Ether Due, none of them have an isolated uh, back power protection on the PoE header. So what I mean by that is power can come into these boards from several different sources. I'm just mushing it around here. Burr, burr, burr. Squirt in some paste. Uh, so power to the Ether 10 can come in from USB obviously. If you just plug it into your USB port it'll get 5 volts from the host computer and that goes in basically it ducks around the back of the voltage regulator the 5 volt regulator and feeds the 5 volt rail directly on the board so if you power from USB the, the onboard oops mirroring it around a bit there the onboard regulator is not going to be used at all. It just takes the raw 5 volts from USB and it feeds it to the rest of the circuit including the input to the 3.3 volt regulator. There is also the DC jack and if you power from the DC jack it goes into the input side of the regulator but there is the complication is that with these boards, because they've got power over Ethernet on them, if the... I should explain what these particular parts are too, because it's... Okay, detour from power. You'll see across here there are a couple of resistor networks, and I'm really screwing up the solder paste application here. But it doesn't actually matter all of that much. These pads here, so this chip is the W5500, which is the WizNet Ethernet chip. In fact, I'm being lazy. I'm going to smoosh straight across the pads here and do it here, and do it here. Now, this probably means I'll end up with solder bridges, but that can be fixed, fixed in post-production. Uh, so, these, just up here, these resistor networks, they are, um, they are bias resistors on mode pins for the W5500. Now, there are how many from memory? I can't remember. The circuit is up on the screen, but I can't see it right now. I think there are about six. Oops, I don't need to be doing that one. Uh, there are about six mode pins. Well, there are eight connected here, but... There are a couple for other purposes. And what they do is set the operational mode of the W5500. So it can be, you can fix it so that it will only run in 10 base T mode or only 100 base T mode. Uh, this one, I don't think I'm actually going to be placing. Sorry, chasing squirrels again. Uh, so you can fix different modes or if you leave the pins floating, it goes into an auto-negotiation mode. So you can do things like enable or disable whether it does uh, MDIX and 
uh, which is negotiating the polarity of the connection, which is for uh, avoiding, well, not really polarity. It's negotiating the TX and RX. So if you've got two devices plugged together, you don't need to use a crossover cable. That feature you can turn on and off. Oh, my syringe is getting really mucky there. Uh, using those bias resistors. So that's these resistor networks here. Now, if you leave them all floating, it goes into an auto-negotiate mode on everything. Basically, it enables all options, but the internal pull-ups and pull-downs, because some of them go up, some of them go down, on those particular pins are fairly weak. I think according to the data sheet, they're equivalent to like 86 kilo ohms. And so the recommendation is that you can either just leave them all floating and it will go into auto negotiate everything mode, or you can bias them explicitly externally, which improves its uh, EMC rating. So it makes it less susceptible to external noise that might cause it to... Have I finished this already? I've just been talking and not paying attention to what I'm doing. So, yeah, it puts it into a mode where it will go... Sorry, I'm pausing while I'm checking over this board to see if I've missed any parts. I don't think so. Uh... I'm going to have to switch to the other camera in a second. It biases the pins internally. I've lost my train of thought entirely. And the because the pull-ups and pull-downs are weak, if it experiences a lot of uh, external electrical noise, it can possibly boot up in an undefined state or an unknown state something that it might see one of those pins as being asserted when you don't want it to be. So what I did was explicitly add uh, resistor networks to bias those pins. That was a very long-winded explanation. All right, so what do we have here? Let, I'm gonna switch this camera around just temporarily, I think, so that you can see this other screen. I don't, this is on a totally separate computer. I don't have any screen sharing or anything set up. So I don't have a direct way of getting access to this screen. And this is going to be really quite awkward to use because I need to be where the camera is. All right, so what I'm going to do is Start by homing the machine. Well, the machine's already homed. I was just wondering if I should show you that process, but I don't think I will. I think I am just going to check a couple of the feeder positions. So the crystal feeder, if I click this little button on here, that will move the camera to the pickup position for that crystal. And I can see on here that it the position looks accurate, so that's okay. And um, 10K resistor, move the camera to that. Pick up position for that looks okay. It's slightly offset to the left, but oh well, close enough. I'm not that fast. So we'll just park the machine. And, oh, I better check that the board is in the right place. So if I go and have a look at Let's see, we'll pick a resist, oh, pick a diode LED and move the camera to that position. And here I can see that the position looks all right. Let's just pick another part, pick a crystal. Where is that? That looks centered enough. Let's find a fiducial. Uh, oops, there's one. Let's go and have a look at a fiducial. It's very slightly off center. That one's spot on. That one's very slightly 
uh, low. So anyway, the board position looks all right. Now, when I'm actually running this job, unfortunately, there is going to be quite a bit of noise. When I'm doing this, I'm normally just moving you around to another perspective. Um, yeah, when I'm running the machine, I normally wear noise cancelling headphones because the compressors, the compressor is annoyingly loud. Well, I don't actually have a proper compressor on this. I've got little 12 volt air pumps. So this is kind of going to suck. Uh, but first I'm going to enable the auto feeders. So feeders are on. I'm going to turn on the, the air pump that does the blow off. So that is the pump that provides positive pressure. And I'll turn on the main back pump. I'll just turn it back off again so I can talk to you again for a second before I run the machine. Now, was there anything that I needed to see in the chat? Because for the next few minutes, this is going to be making noise and I'm not really going to be able to talk to you. Um, okay, oh, Mike asked a really interesting question. Is it worth having a generic stencil with only a QFN so you could use it once on any board with a QFN? That would be really useful, but you'd have to put it on first. So that's actually a really clever idea. You could just align it with the particular QFN part and put the, stent, put the paste onto that and then manually put the, uh, the paste onto the rest of it. Uh, all right. So, now, <laughs> This is another one of those situations where I have failures on this uh, pick and place machine so often that this could all end up being a disaster. But let's see how we go. All right, I'm going to enable the air pumps. So we're going to have a whole lot of noise and then a few minutes of action while it's putting pieces into place. And uh, while it's doing it, I'll probably pick the camera up and see if we can get a slightly better view of it. So, here we go, vacuum pump on, and then the noise will begin.
Hooray, now you can hear me again. All right, so I'll just move the camera back down here and then I'll chuck this under the microscope and we'll see how badly we stuffed it up. Well, we, I, I'm not putting any of the blame for this on you. So, there are a whole bunch of parts on here that haven't been placed and I'm sure that most of the parts that are on there are only approximately in the right position. But I'm not really paying, putting a whole lot of care into this. Uh, so, let's see, oh yeah. Oh look, these ones are all offset sideways. I wonder why that is, that was weird. Oh look, it's only barely on the pads. That would have probably reflowed okay. Oh, these ones are really off. It's all off to the right. I wonder why. Uh, I think there were... Oh no, that, that's right. These were odd value parts that I'm going to have to pull out of my mixed parts kit. I didn't have those in feeders. Don't know what that part is. We'll find out. And those ones... Lots and lots of parts missing. So unfortunately I'm going to have to manually place quite a few parts here. What's going on with that? Yeah, it's alright. It's alright. Not great, but it would reflow. Oops. I think my finger was on that one. Okay, so. That leaves a very sadly large number of parts that still need to be put on by hand. So. Let's start with just chucking on the ones that I've lifted from this other board. Uh, where's the... oh yeah, there's pin zero, so I'll chuck on the, the AT Mega. And I also need to get a W5500 from somewhere. That could be kind of important. Oh, and I need uh, one of these chips. I might even leave that off for now. I can always do more of this later. Hang on, that machine is buzzing and making horrible noises in the background. So let's turn this off. Uh, machine is parked and I'll disconnect from the motion controller. And yes, yes, yes. Timed out waiting for connection. Do I want to save? Yeah, okay. So, quitting out of OpenPNP, and you probably can't even really see me right now. Turn that off, turn that off, turn the positive pressure pump off, and now we have some peace. Hooray! Much more relaxing. Oh, except that the feeders are still active. I'm going to shut down that computer. And then the feeders will shut down as well. Yes, now we have some peace. So, where was I? That's right. I was grabbing pieces off here. So, I'll chuck that one on. That's one that I lifted off some other part. And, oh, these parts are really close to the edge, right where my finger goes. So, that's a little annoying. All right, so a W5500 I've got to grab from somewhere. I should have a few of those. In fact, I probably have them just up here. I do indeed. Now, what's happening in the chat? Um, for hot air, sand in a pan and an oven. Sand for hobbyists on the cheap, which I wasn't expecting. That's interesting. So, in the chat, there was some question about using hot air for hobbyist level stuff, and a suggestion for a video uh, by Great Scott about using sand in an oven. Uh, I've never heard of that technique. I assume that the sand is just a way of providing uh, some thermal stability or something so that it maybe so that it can 
um, you know, give some thermal mass and bring everything up to the same temperature. I don't really know what that's about. Uh, what else? The, uh, okay, so, so some questions about the pick and place machine. So Ian said, is that the sound of the servo motors or stepper um, when aligning the fiducials? So that, uh, there were two different things you're hearing. One is the stepper motors and they kind of whine all the time. At the moment, the motion controller is set up so that the motors are engaged constantly, which means that even when the machine's not in motion, the motors are powered and that stops anything from moving so that it maintains its position because it's an open loop control system. It's not closed loop. It's got no feedback on its actual position other than counting steps. But the, the main annoying buzzing noise is that all of the feeders have servos in them and they're just little hobby servos, total, really cheap little Tower Pro um, digital servos. So when all the, um, the feeders are powered up, those servos just sit there going constantly, which is really annoying. Uh, um, INC on asked if I've tried sticking some foam around them. Uh, no, I haven't. So the servos are just inside the 3D printed feeders. Um, and oh, Paul asked, it's picking and placing all the components. No, so I just did some of the basic jelly bean parts. All of the unusual ones, like the the ICs, voltage regulators, and that sort of stuff that aren't loaded in the machine, I'm just sticking on by hand. But what I find is that using the machine for hybrid assembly is a real help because I've got things like all the really common stuff, like 1K resistors, 10K resistors, 100 nanofarad capacitors, you know, all of the things that you find that you have in pretty much every single project are loaded on the machine. LEDs, you know, common stuff which means that it's actually a really big time saver, even for a single board like this, to put it on the machine and let it put all of those basic parts in place. And then all you have to place by hand are the exceptions. So just the unusual parts that aren't already loaded. So, what else do I have? I've got a, um, an FDN here. Uh, at some point, I'm going to have to look up the the overlay for this board and see what parts are actually meant to go on it. These ones I just put on because I happen to know what they are. They're obvious. It's a bit hard to miss the CPU. But many of these other parts, I don't know what they are. Not without checking the positions. So, uh, while I'm here... And to get them out of the way, I'm just going to stick the big fat voltage regulators on there. And there are some electrolytic caps that go on here, but I'm going to leave those for now because they are very easy to bump and end up getting out of position. So now I'm going to do some uh, diodes. So just standard uh, one in four double oh four. So you know the classic rectifier diodes. I actually have these on a in a feeder in the machine, and I'm uh, I didn't place them because there is a something weird going on with that particular feeder. I did a board a couple of days ago, and when the machine moved across to that feeder, it lost its position and then started putting all the subsequent parts down about 30 millimeters too far to one side. Not just slightly out, it was like it had missed a bunch of steps or something. So I need to figure out what that is. But in the meantime, I just put those parts on and I skipped them in the setup on the pick and place machine. Now, uh, that's a one meg resistor. I happen to remember that one. So I've got a resistor kit here, which I use for uh, all of these parts. So 
a little one meg resistor that goes across the crystal. Hmm, interesting. Why didn't I put a one meg resistor across the 16 megahertz crystals? I don't remember. It's pretty normal to have something like a high value resistor across the uh, the crystal. So you got the two loading caps on the side of it, the crystal, and then in this case a one meg resistor across it. But I didn't do that on the 16 megahertz crystals. I don't think they are on the Ether 10 either. Ah, okay, so Sion's comment about the foam was about the vacuum pumps. They sound like they're, they are vibrating. Yeah, they're noisy because it's, they're not a proper, if I had a proper compressor and someone else, who was it? Oh, Dodgy suggested having a big vacuum canister uh, like some cars do to provide a vacuum reservoir. Yeah, that's pretty common as well. And on DIY pick and place machines, I've seen a few people that have used these little vacuum pumps, the little 12 volt vacuum pumps, and then they just use something like a can as a vacuum reservoir and attach some fittings to it and hoses. That seems to help as well, so that's something that I might do. All right, I think it's at the point, oh, not quite. I was going to say, I think it's at the point where I need to look at the overlay, but there are some more parts that I can put on here without needing to look anything up. There are some little tantalums that go into different places here. Where are there? I think there were a few tantalums on this board. There was that one. Surely that's not the only one. Maybe it is. I may have ended up substituting other parts in place of the tantalums. Just scanning around the board now, trying to find it. Hopefully this isn't making you seasick. Yeah, I can't find any other... Oh, there's one. There is one other tantalum that goes on there. That must be on the 3.3 volt rail. Yes, it is. So this is the 3.3 volt regulator. Uh, these are the status LEDs for Ethernet and you can see that there are some resistor networks that go in here for current limiting on those. Now what value did I have? I've just got to have a look over here. So I used 1K resistor networks on there as current limiting on those LEDs. They, oops, ah, I messed that up. They don't need to be bright so in fact, you could even use a higher value than 1K, but this will do for now. And while I'm doing this, I might as well put on the other resistor networks as well. So what have we got? We've got one up here. We've got two across here. There's another one up there. Another one here. So this one is the, so this is the back of the Ethernet connector. And then these are the data lines from the Ethernet connection. So it's TX positive and negative, RX positive and negative. And you can see just here, this is where the, um, the static protection uh, things go on. So I need to add those as well. I can't remember what that part is. But these ones are 49.9 ohm resistors. I think, let's see, did I pick up the right one? Yes, I did. 49R9. That go into the data lines. Right, there's um, some other, yeah, it's so long since I've looked at this circuit now. It's been weeks and weeks. So my memory is not that great. Uh, other things, somewhere in here there is an inductor. In fact, that might, no, where is the inductor? I haven't fitted it, I need to put it on manually. Somewhere around there, I need to put an inductor in. Okay, so first though, I'll just chuck a couple of resistor networks on here. And these ones are bias. I've got a bunch of 1K networks, so I'm gonna put those on. These could just be 10K, could be 22K or whatever. It doesn't really matter. 
This is just to provide a stronger bias to those mode pins. 1K is a lower value than I would normally use on, uh, on bias resistors, particularly if the bias resistors need to be overcome by something else. Like if you've got an input that you're pulling in one direction or the other, and then you want to, what is that one? 10 microfarad, one. And then you want to be able to overcome that. Oh, one micro Henry, there it is. So there is the inductor. So normally if you were having some kind of an input, like um, a digital input connected to a switch, now where is it? There it is. That's where the one micro Henry inductor goes. Uh, so the purpose of that inductor is to provide some isolation from or for the digital supply for the Ethernet chip from the rest of the circuit. So it keeps the power supply for the uh, for that chip nice and clean. Now I also need what else is there? So a resistor network that goes right up in this corner for these other LEDs and different things this is probably 1K. Yes it is. So that's a 1K resistor network. So I'll chuck that one in. And what's this one? 10K. All right, so I've got to stick a 10K resistor network on there and a 1K up in the corner. Where are we? Up in the corner, there. And while I'm here, I may as well stick in the ATmega 16U2. So pin one down in the bottom right corner and I've got one here that I floated off one of the other boards. So basically this chip is totally upside down. Alrighty. Uh, where were those resistor networks? Over here. So this one is the 10K resistor network. Is that a 10K? Yes it is. I've just got a little pile of resistor networks that I pulled off these other boards. So I've got to check each one just to make sure I'm putting the right one into place. This is the MAC address ROM and unless I pull one off another board I don't think I have one handy. Oh a couple of more resistor networks. There's that one there and this one here. These are the voltage dividers for the SD card and I can't remember which way around they go so let's cheat and look at the circuit. What do we have here? So the one down the bottom is a 2K2 and the one above is a 1K. So, so you can see that's a 1K resistor network and down here is a 2K2 resistor network. So 1K goes up the top, 102, and then this one is a 2.2K resistor network. Uh, just trying to read this with, without using the microscope. Yes, I picked up the right one. Now, I'm sure that assembling boards like this is not a spectator sport. This seems like a particularly boring way to be spending your time sitting here watching someone else assemble a board. Particularly when that person is distracting themselves talking about other things and not working very efficiently. I'm just going to grab a surface mount button out of my um, my parts cabinet stuck on the wall over there and stick the reset switch on there. Uh, okay so this here that, that you can see, there's no crystal on there. That's because I don't actually have any 25 megahertz crystals in that footprint. So I'm going to bodge an HC49 US format crystal into that position. Um, now I am actually really tempted to find one of these uh, MAC address ROMs on another board and float it off and put it onto here so that we can test that feature. I think I might do that. Even though it's going to be noisy, I'll use the... It'll be a chance to show off using the um, the preheater, which is cool for those who haven't seen that in use before. But first, what's going on up here? <laughs> Just saying, but first, reminds me. I can't remember if I've mentioned this before. There's um, 
friend of mine, uh, Paul Fenwick, who's <laughs> got a, a bit of a funny sense of humour. Uh, many, many years ago, he implemented a, uh, a feature in Perl because he's one of the core Perl developers. I'm not sure if he's doing that anymore, but um, he used to, he and Jacinta Richardson used to run Perl Training Australia. And as a bit of a joke at Open Source Developers Conference many years ago, he wrote a module for Perl which implemented a feature called but first. And the, uh, the logic for it was that you're writing your code and you've written all this stuff and you're going down the, down the page and then you realize that you want something else to happen before the thing that you've already written. Now, the logical thing to do, of course, is to go back up and edit your previous code. But in Paul's bizarre logic, he decided, wouldn't it be funny to have a language construct where you would type that out and then you would type, but first, and then do something totally different. And then when it's executed, it would go through and execute the, the thing that you'd said, but first, first, even though it was not first in the program. So you could write programs backwards. And uh, <laughs> as if Perl is not enough of a brain twister, that made it even more interesting. So, uh, where, what am I looking for? I'm looking for those two pads that you can see there that are unpopulated, which are directly behind the USB connector. And what are they? Oh, there's a 5K one that's in place. My um, overlay position here is not very good. Oh, PGB, so these are static protection um, TVCs. And what else are we missing around here? Nothing. Okay. So we need two static protection uh, things which are, once again, I keep those in a drawer over here. So I'm going to go and cut a couple of bits off the tape. I've got little bits of cut tape stuck in the drawer over there where you couldn't see out of camera view. So, I've just cut off a little bit of tape, drop it out on the bench. Yeah, this, um, <laughs> whatever I'm talking about during this process is even more of a random train of consciousness than usual. Because I keep being distracted by what I'm trying to do, which is assemble this board. I haven't even got back to the whole issue of the power source and the extra diode that I started talking about right at the beginning of this process. All right, so these are the little uh, Zener protection things that uh, limit the voltage that can be applied to the data lines on the USB connection. And that is to provide some protection both for the host computer, although they're usually pretty well protected. Oops, out of field of view there. And for this device. Now, what is that part that wasn't placed? Let's scroll over here. One microfarad 0603. That's interesting. I thought I had one microfarad 0603s loaded in the machine. But apparently I... Oh, I do. Why wasn't that one placed? I don't know. Maybe I just didn't set it up when I was loading the job into the machine. So I'll have to go for the generic resist, uh, generic capacitor pack. And there we go. There's a one microfarad 0603. Oh, look, you can see I've got just a dab of solder paste. Ah, there must have been some solder paste on the nozzle which can happen after something like a, where things go wrong, like you get a mispick and then it tries to place it because it hasn't detected the part isn't there. And you can end up shoving the nozzle of the pick and place machine into the solder paste, which is never good. You end up with solder paste stuck on the nozzle and then it attaches to uh, whatever part you pick up next. And sometimes it can do things like make it difficult to put the part down. And uh, that's 
one of the reasons that I set up positive pressure on my machine. So I've got a little aquarium pump. Oh, look, there's a part that isn't placed and a couple above it. What is that one? And what are the two above it? So yeah, I've got a little aquarium pump providing some a small amount of positive pressure. Now, where on the board is this? It's between the voltage regulators, which is uh, down here. So that one is placed. This one is not. Oh, it's another one microfarad 0603, I think. Yes, it is. I shouldn't have put away my cap kit. Uh, yeah, so I've, I um, originally had the vacuum nozzle set up so that when it was placing a part, it would just isolate the nozzle from vacuum so it was no longer positively pulling it onto the nozzle. And I then changed it so that I've got to blow off positive pressure. But you need to make sure it's only a small amount of positive pressure because the problem is that otherwise it can basically be like a little high pressure air jet. What have we got here? 4.7 microfarad and 10 nanofarad. Okay. Uh, so what can happen is it'll blow other bits of other parts around off the board. I've had that happen before. It's not fun. Now this one, <laughs> this is going to be a real bodge. This is a 10 nanofarad. It has to go in between and I'm putting an 0805 part here onto an 0603 pad. That'll work just fine. These are slightly oversized pads anyway. You can see that the pad still overlaps the end of the part. And then I need a 4.7 microfarad. That is a weird value to have. What have I got? Uh, 1, 10. Hmm. How can I do that? I don't think I have a 4.7 microfarad. I don't even know how critical that one is. I have a feeling that that is just a bias. No, what is it? I think it might be for the internal regulator of the, here we go, switching to schematic mode, uh, for the internal regulator of the W5500. And where is that part? There it is. 4.7 microfarad and it is two cap. So two cap, yeah, that can be 10 microfarad. I remember reading about that on the, uh, on the WizNet forum. Someone was questioning that. So that is just part of the internal voltage regulator. Internally, the WizNet, um, this, the W5500, I think runs at 1.8 volts. I can't remember. It'll be there somewhere shown on the nets. Oh, 1.2 volts. So internally, so what you do is you feed it 3.3 volts and it generates its own internal 1.2 volt reference. And that 4.7 microfarad capacitor, which is where the one is missing right now that you can see in the center of the microscope view, that is uh, essentially a like a bulk cap for the internal voltage regulator. And it is perfectly happy if you give it a bigger value. Not ridiculously bigger, but um, the data sheet suggests 4.7 microfarads, but you can put uh, 10 microfarads on there and it's not a problem. Well, when we get to testing this, we will see if it's a problem. Now, we've got two more parts here. What are these ones? Ah, okay, interesting. So, well, there's another 10 microfarad up, a oh, 10 nanofarad up there. But there is also a 12.4K resistor, and this is the external voltage reference. This was discussed on a previous live stream. So first I'm gonna stick on the 10 nanofarad, which I also don't have in 0603. I do have it in 0402, so I could just stick an 0402 on there, but that'll do. So this part that is missing now is a, sorry, I'm looking at my resistor kit. It is 
an external reference for the internal voltage regulator once again. So that one needs to be a 12.4k. I've actually just put on a 12.1k. And yes, I know that works. This is just to check that I haven't screwed up the PCB fixes the new layout. So what have we got here? 10 nanofarad, 22 nanofarad, and 10R. Okay, so these are changes. 10 ohm resistor. I don't have one of those in the pick and place machine, so I'll grab one of those manually. And what I really should do is have a look at the chat in a minute. I'm probably talking to myself because you've all left because I'm ignoring you. Uh, 10 nanofarad and 22 nanofarad. Uh, let's see. What is another 10 nanofarad? This one, another 0805, which is like a jumbo part. You know, those novelty pencils that are oversized and takes two hands to pick one up. That's what it reminds me of using 0805 parts. They're so big. 22 nanofarad. All right, where is a 22 nanofarad? Oh, look, I don't have those in 0603 either. Only in 0402 and 0805, so I'll stick an 0805 on there. Uh, what's going on here? We're getting dangerously close to having all the parts placed. Now we still need the SD card. I'm leaving that towards the end because it's easy to bump. That crystal doesn't go on. Oh, that's right, we don't have the MAC address ROM yet. And I'll leave that till last. And we've got the two capacitors. Amazing, I think we're nearly done. Thanks for sticking with me through this. All right, so to get this MAC address ROM, I am going to pull it off one of the other boards. What will I pull it from? Okay, there's this one. Yeah, I think I'll pull it from this one. This is the second most recent of the prototypes. So, to do this, let's see if I can do this in a way that you can see. Uh, I'm gonna, I might even do it under the microscope, which normally I wouldn't do but that way it'll be easy, easier for you to see what's going on. So, can I get this into the right position? And also this is gonna be noisy, really noisy. Oh, I've gotta lift the microscope way, way up because, oh look, you can see some of the hacks that I did on this board. Oh look, little chops and things. So this is on a previous prototype. Now that part that says HSR7, that is, the MAC address ROM. I'll just move it across there a bit. And <clears throat> it's going to become a bit loud now, unfortunately. So on and heat is on. All right, so while that's warming up, I'm going to have a quick look at whether there are other things I need to respond to in the chat, which I'm sure there are by now. Okay. All right, so, oh, Mike Causa asked, are resistor networks, hang on, I'm gonna move away from this uh, noisy little thing so that I can talk to you without being overwhelmed, without you being overwhelmed by the noise of it. So, are resistor networks just 4X in the same package in parallel? Yes, exactly. That. <clears throat> that same job could be done by putting four single resistors in place. Resistor networks are, um, they're convenient because it means that you can put them on with a single movement of the pick and place machine. So instead of having to go to the feeder four times and put four things down, you can pick up one thing and put it down once, which means effectively it speeds your assembly process up and makes it four times faster. And uh, it also saves, can save a little bit of space. I'm going to get back to chat. I'm going to get this piece off 
so that I can then turn off the hot air because it is loud and annoying. So I don't know if you can see what I'm doing in the side camera. So I've got the machine, I've got the preheater running, the board is preheated, and I'm going to use the hot air to warm up that particular part. Oh, you can see down below, I oh know it's off your field of view, there is flux on the board that is reflowing already. So you can see that I only had to touch the hot air on that for a moment and that part lifted right off. So now I'll switch it into cool down mode and shove that back out of the way. Um, I normally leave it running in cool down mode for a minute not so much for the benefit of the board, but for the benefit of the reef of the preflow heater. Because if I turn the preflow heater off when it's at peak heat, uh, the airflow stops, and then there is potentially a problem with heat soak and overheating the mechanism of the heater. But that's been running for a minute now. So I'll turn that off, which will be a great relief to everybody. All right, so now I've got to get this microscope back to its normal operating height, down about there somewhere. Looks okay. Oh look, there's a hair and in, getting into the the works. Uh, can't pick it up. Can't. Oh, there it is. Okay, so back up to the top of the board up here. So this is where the MAC address ROM goes. Pin one is in the bottom left. Now that question a second ago was about resistor networks. And you can see here, for example, I've got these two resistor networks. That could have been just eight resistors in parallel, which would have meant eight placements, but instead we've got two networks and it's two placements. So you can see mechanically, it's quite obvious what it is. It's basically it's almost like you've got four separate resistors bound together mechanically so that it's into a single thing. <clears throat> and typically, if you're using something like one of these K16 networks, physically that will be a little bit less board space than if you have four 0603 resistors side by side. Now, let's get this into place. So pin one is down here, that's where the dot is. Don't know if you can see it through the camera, but there is a dot on this uh, part as well, which is on this, so that's aligned. Okay, I think we are just about at the end of our assembly process. I'm going to stick the SD card on there. Now, the thing is that <clears throat> this particular revision of the board has, it does have a couple of important changes on it, like related to the power supply but much of it is exactly the same as the previous prototype, including the SD card area. So I'm as confident as I can be that the SD card is going to work, but it's always a good idea to do a complete end-to-end -end test if you can. So I'll populate that. And also this part of the circuit hasn't changed at all in multiple revisions of this and it's always worked perfectly so that part is probably okay. Now we are down to the last couple of things. Let's stick on these electrolytics. Uh, <laughs> oh look at that you can see under the microscope that this electrolytic has a melted base. Let's see what's the field of view like. There it is. Look down around here, it's all melted. Up here it's melted. That's because I pulled that off with the, uh, the hot air gun off another board just before the live stream began. I just got a couple of those boards up and just started stripping parts off them. And now we've got the USB-C socket. So I'll turn the whole board around because I'm right-handed. I want to come in from this angle and put a socket on. So first I've got to get a socket. I've got them on a strip of tape over here. I'll cut one off. And put this one on. So 
USB-C sockets are a total pain. I hate them. Well, I love them and I hate them. I love them from the point of view of the cables and the mechanical connection and convenience of them. I hate them from the point of view of board design and compatibility. Now, let's have a... Before I stick it on the board, I'm going to turn it over and show you the bottom of it. So this is the bottom of the USB-C connector. And this is actually a simplified connector. A full USB-C connector has uh, 24 pins plus a couple plus like shield and that sort of thing. This has only 16 pins. And that's because this particular connector is designed specifically for use in systems that only require backward compatibility with USB 3 and they don't require all of the extra feature pins like you're not going to be running video or other things through it it's just a an old style USB connection but with a new USB-C connector so you can see here these are the power pins the ones that are doubled up to increase their current carrying capacity because USB-C can take a ridiculous amount of power and then we've got a small number of pins through here, which are the ones that provide data and things like the mode pins, the mode uh, that need to be biased to say what mode you're operating in because USB-C does everything. Uh, okay, so I'll just chuck that one on the board. Uh, the first few USB-C devices that I made had... Um, uh, yeah, had full USB-C connectors on them and they were horrible to work with. They were a combination of surface mount, so you can see along the here we've got the surface mount connections that are going to the USB-C socket but they also had through hole pins because they've got so many connections that they needed to use a combination of both and the pins were tiny and the holes had to be like 0.3 millimeter and there was no clearance around them generally horrible things to work with. Now I'm going to take this out of the microscope, have a quick overall look at the board and just make sure that I'm not missing anything. I think I have all of the parts on it. So <clears throat> let's go back to this view and unfortunately there's going to be a bit of noise with this as well. Now can we see there? Okay, the reflow oven tends to make a little bit of noise and we've got this huge 3000 watt reflow oven that's going to have a single board in it which is kind of annoying. So I've just got to select the temperature profile and start. And uh, if you have a device in your home, she who shall not be named, one of those home automation devices. I've got to use a command now, so maybe hit the mute button on top of yours so that I don't make yours do silly things. So I'm going to say, Alexa, turn on the exhaust fan. Okay. All right, and now, here is the little control for it. Now this is the, um, the control panel for the reflow oven and I've modified it to put it inside this wooden box. So I've basically built a box that goes over the top of the oven and then I cut a hole in it to expose the control panel. And down here you can see that there is an exhaust vent. There is a white T-piece down the back, comes down to this and that blue exhaust goes down under the bench and it runs all the way around the room and there is a, oops, I'll just move this back to here. And there is a, an exhaust fan down that way that pulls the air out and it vents it outside the room. So while that is doing its thing, let's have a quick look at comments that I've missed. Uh, come on, open up. All right, yeah, that reflow oven's gonna take a few minutes to run. I think it's about six minutes, give or take, for a cycle. So let's see, all right. 
Lots and lots of comments that I've got to catch up on. Uh, right, so um, Ian said, could it pipeline the component feeder rather than feed before pick? Um, could it pipeline the component feeder rather than feed before pick? So does that mean that you, that it would run the feeder to have it in the pick position in advance? Uh, so yes, that is just a setting in, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I may not be. There is a setting in open PNP. It really comes down to how the feeders are configured. So what you can do is set it so that the feeders advance immediately so that there is always a part ready and available. And um, that means basically it, it just makes your job run faster because the machine doesn't have to stop and wait for the feeder to run before it picks it up with the head. Um, I don't have that set up on my machine because I use it in this sort of way a lot. I use it for a very small number of boards, often just one board at a time. And I don't want it to be sitting in between jobs with all the parts exposed. So I take the small performance hit and make sure that all of the tapes are sealed and closed until they're actually needed. Otherwise there'd be like a row of parts exposed sitting on it and you know, dust gets in and all sorts of things. Um, all right, so yeah, there are some things I was talking about earlier that I need to get back to, but I'll just work through these questions. Uh, all right, so number 11 was all the caps. I'm not sure what that question is. So Gerald42 said number 11 was all the caps. I don't get that. Um, all right, so Steve said, can you speak about how you get things lined up, the initial setting and any drift of components once placed? Okay, cool. Maybe once all of this is done, I'll go back into OpenPNP and I'll show you some of the setup of that. The way, there are a couple of different ways that can be done. OpenPNP has import scripts for um, for a variety of formats. So in your CAD program, doesn't matter what it is, if you're going to be sending files off to a factory, you need to be able to generate files that they can load into their pick and place machines. And the standard way of doing that is, um, uh, is centroid files. So it's a file, it's basically a text file and it just lists the position of all the parts. So the parts name, its value, its rotation in degrees, and its position X and Y. And typically they have a .mnt extension, like a mount extension. And you can generate those placement files from Altium or KiCad or Eagle or whatever. It doesn't matter what you use. It's a pretty standard sort of thing. And in OpenPNP, it has import routines for a variety of formats, including native Eagle files. So for, so I've got a, uh, basically there is a dedicated Ubuntu machine running the pick and place machine. There's a PC motherboard stuck in the bottom of it running Ubuntu. And I've got that synced on Dropbox. So what happens is that as I'm editing files in Eagle, they all get synced onto Dropbox and updated pretty much live on the pick and place machine. So inside OpenPNP, I can go to, I can just select new board, import, Eagle and it just imports the .brd file and populates everything in the um, in the pick and place job. And then I go through and assign which feeders are for which parts, uh, which ones are fiducials and a few other things. There's a little bit of setup. But for this particular board I did that setup right before the live stream started. That was um, that was what I was doing up until a few minutes before and it took me maybe 10 minutes to set up the job including, so that was from importing the file, assigning the feeders for the parts, etc. Uh, it doesn't take that long. All right, so, uh, oh, so Jack's Tech 
uh, clarified that thing earlier about reflow if you don't have a reflow oven sand in a skillet okay so I guess in that case the sand is uh, yeah providing a bit of a thermal mass in the skillet so it's not just the metal itself and um, Peter asked if I can get back to talking about the power regulator diode um, yeah okay so that part of the circuit in fact while we're waiting for the reflow oven to do its thing I'm going to switch back to desktop here we go we can look at it in Eagle oops that's not what I want this is what I want all right where is that particular part of the circuit I have aha uh -huh, here we go this is the big change this thing here is a new diode that I just added in this version of the PCB so power input to an Arduino can come from the uh, the USB connection or the DC jack so with the DC jack where is that um, which sheet am I looking at okay here we go so we've got the USB VCC auto switch we've got V in uh, which is okay I'm going to ignore most of this circuit for now I've talked about this in the past this particular part of the circuit is a switch that prioritizes power coming from the DC jack over USB so if you have both USB and the DC jack plugged in at the same time it will disable USB um, power and it will draw power from the DC jack and that's because there are often situations where you might want to use V in and pull it out for some other purpose maybe you're putting 12 volts in on the DC jack and you need 12 volts to power your peripheral devices or whatever you've got connected and also you can pull more current through the DC jack than you can through USB so the priority is to take power from the, the DC jack and only use USB if there's no other power available that's what this particular circuit achieves so what we've got is the output here goes to the 5 volt rail coming from USB VCC that's directly to the 5 volt rail which is behind the regulator so if we look at the regulator up here and you can see that that net is highlighted that is because 5 volts coming from USB VCC comes to the back side of the regulator but if this power was not available you don't have USB and you do have power coming in on the DC uh, jack in, what will happen is that the power comes in here from the DC jack so this is the 2.1 mil DC jack power comes in here there is a reverse polarity protection diode here and that goes on to the input side of the voltage regulator and then you get 5 volts out but this is the tricky thing normally Arduino boards only have those two sources of power if you don't count, talk about the headers just ignore the headers it's USB or DC in and because this one has power over Ethernet support this V in net here is also used for another purpose so you can see here we've got the protection diode on the DC jack and if I go back to where is it is it that one no which sheet do I need to be on this sheet okay so this is the network socket where power over Ethernet can come in and what happens is that if you feed power over Ethernet down through here oh hang on I've got to turn off the oven and I'll turn that off and also Alexa turn off the exhaust fan okay okay so <laughs> all the background That's noises okay. has gone now Alexa stop so okay back to this so power comes in from the Ethernet cable down this net goes to the PoE regulator or like the module or uh, just through the jumper 
and then it comes in and this diode now feeds into V in. So what do you need to keep in mind? It's unfortunate that these are on different sheets of the schematic because it's not so easy to see. But we have power coming in. This is the power from power over ethernet through this diode going into V in. If we go back to this sheet, here we have power from the DC jack coming through this diode also going to V in. So essentially we have and <laughs> it's a diode based OR gate. Uh, you can take power from either of those sources, but because they're both feeding through diodes, neither of them can back power the other. And that is the primary change that I made with this version of the PCB. So the, if you have a DC uh, power source plugged in here, and you might be exposing, I don't know, 12 volts or something on here, on V in, with previous versions of this board, so the Ether 10 in particular, what would happen is that V in is powered, which is this net here. That diode didn't exist, and V in could be fed back through here. And if you had this jumper in place, and you plugged this into an Ethernet switch that didn't have an injector, what you would do is end up applying your 12 volts back down this line here and to here and you would potentially back power the ethernet. Now there is something weird going on. You see this line here, V plus, comes in here and this is a little schematic of the internals of the RJ45 socket. Because this socket supports power over ethernet it's got these little uh, rectifier bridges built into it and it's got these little uh, transformers as well. In theory, if you apply plus 12 volts on this, it should be stopped by all of these diodes. You can see that there are four diodes here that are facing in towards this point and it shouldn't be possible to backpower the ethernet by bridging this across. But there is definitely something weird going on. I've seen this myself. I've had other people report it to me that this is a potentially dangerous situation because you can end up with power going back up your, um, your ethernet connection and possibly damaging your ethernet switch. And I've actually seen it. I did a test where I put jumpers onto this header. I put a 12 volt power supply onto the board and connected it to my little desktop ethernet switch and the ethernet switch got stinking hot and stopped working. Luckily, it started working again a few minutes later after it cooled down when I disconnected everything. But even though the internal schematic of this RJ45 socket says that power should not possibly be able to come in here and go anywhere else, there is still something going on inside the RJ45 socket that allows that to happen. So that is why I added this diode, even though it should be redundant. Anyway, now we have multiple ways of feeding power and it should be a little bit safer. All right, let's have a look at the board and see how it came out. <clears throat> so there is our little tiny board in our oversized reflow oven. Um, now I did see there was a question earlier about hacking toaster ovens and yes that's what I did for many many years before I had that oven. In fact I still have a toaster oven sitting out in the garage with a PID controller attached to it so I've got a thermocouple, there's an Arduino which is running um, and it's got a screen on it so it does the proper reflow curve. It brings the temperature up to the soak temperature, holds it for a while, goes up to, it does the spike, brings the temperature up to reflow and then the cool down. And I've even attached it to a servo. So once it gets to the appropriate point in the cool down cycle, it uses the servo and pulls the door of the toaster oven slightly open so that airflow can get through and it cools down more quickly. Uh, but I stopped using that when I got this one. But if you're thinking of doing that, check out the Reflow Master, Reflow Master Pro, I think it is. 
which is Sion's project to make a controller for reflow ovens. So if you're thinking about doing a retrofit to like a, a cheap toaster oven, then have a look at Sion's Reflow Master. Oh, Philip uh, pointed out, I keep saying RJ45, and he said AP8C, not RJ45. Okay, so I was using the, um, the lazy terminology. So the name of that socket technically I think is not RJ45. All right, let's have a look at this under the microscope and see what has happened. See how much of a disaster we have. Uh, okay, uh, first thing I'm gonna look for is solder bridges and weird things going on. Now, if we look at these, you can see the, uh, the resistor networks here are actually fairly clean. They've ended up uh, reflowing nicely. I think I can see a tiny little solder bridge just in here. And I might have to do a little bit of uh, spot cleaning up. Mm -mm. Yep, there's a solder bridge just there. Don't know if you can see that. Uh, hang on, I'm gonna try zooming right in. Unfortunately, the view with the camera is not as good as the view through the optical eyepieces. So I can actually see this a whole lot better than you can. And I'll try turning, I'll adjust the brightness a little bit. Which way? That way. Yeah, so to me, it's very clear that there is a little solder bridge between these two pins. Um, you could probably just barely see it right there. Okay, now that is um, a little bit too zoomed in to get context. So I'm gonna zoom it back out again. Uh, so, what I should be doing is fixing these as I find them, not just moving on and then possibly forgetting about fixing it. So I've just got a little bit of solder wick here. I'll just pull that one out and pull out that solder bridge. Gone. Uh, oh look, there's another one up here, just up in the top corner. I'll lift that one out. Gone. And the rest of that chip looks okay. So coming up here, I don't see any major problems. Uh, the AT Mega is such a coarse pitch that there's, um, there are no problems with that. No solder bridges there. That looks okay. There are some little spots of solder you can see, like just on the top of this LED, there was a spot. I think that was put there by the nozzle. Button seems okay. Crystal looks all right. Coming across here. That all looks okay. The other crystal looks all right. Uh, the 16U2. Looks okay, like sometimes you can see if there are little bridges, you can see the bulges on the outside of the chip are joined. I probably put just a touch too much solder on these pads and you can see it's bulging out. As the chip has squished itself down, the solder has bulged out. But it looks acceptable. Uh, looking across the back of the USB-C connector, that looks acceptable. Oh look, this has skewed itself. This was actually straighter when it went into the oven and it's ended up twisting itself, pulling under uh, surface tension, probably because I didn't put the solder paste on straight. I just vaguely squirted it onto the pad. Now, one thing I often do with these connectors is try to look down into them. So I'll pull the microscope off the bench so I can get the right angle and look into the back of it. And you can see that there are no visible bridges there. Sometimes there are bridges between the pins down inside it uh, where the case is hiding it from you. So if you look down the back like that, you can often pick up problems that you can't see any other way. But that looks fine. Uh, what else coming down here? Caps are attached properly. Voltage regulators are on. Oh, that solder joint looks a little bit iffy. It hasn't wetted properly. I and mean, this is because I'm using crappy parts that I pulled off another board. And I didn't have 
I didn't use flux or anything. I just, I, I didn't clean the parts up, I didn't do anything, I just pulled them off the other board and stuck them on, which is not ideal. So, uh, come on, get some heat into that. Nope, better still, let's get some flux onto it. <clears throat> um, smush, smush, smush on the flux. All right. And yeah, the solder is not taking to the the pin very well. I don't think this really matters because there will be an electrical connection there. I'm putting a lot of heat into this because this is connected to the ground plane, this particular pin, and it's um, a lot of thermal mass there. Those are crappy looking joints. Disgusting. Oh well, it should be enough to test the functionality of this board at least. Uh, now, what else? Oh look, I was a bit enthusiastic with the solder paste and it's squirted some little um, solder balls out the side. Now, next stage with this, uh, you can see that it doesn't have the, um, the Ethernet socket on here, it doesn't have the DC jack, and uh, doesn't have any of the headers obviously either but we can add those if we need them don't need them for testing though so what I'm going to do is do some very basic functionality testing using uh, well first thing I'm going to do how can I show you this I need to get another USB cable Where's the USB cable? Right here. I need a USB-C cable so that I can power this up in view of the camera. <laughs> Switch to overhead and can we get some zoom on it? How far in can we go and still focus? Approximately there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is power that up and it hasn't exploded, which is good. And in fact, you can see, oh, I know what I need to do. I need to put this other, uh, before I get to that though, I need to put the other crystal on there. But before I get to that, I'm going to do some just basic functionality testing on this. You can see that we've got the power LED on and you can see that this is actually running blink. That's because I pulled this uh, 18 mega off another board and it's already got that sketch loaded onto it. So what I'm going to do now is pull up the Arduino IDE and just try loading. I'm going to do the blink load and see what happens. Um, just so that you can't see what's coming up in my IDE, I'm just switching to the front camera temporarily because I think the IDE is going to open up with some projects that I was working on for a customer and uh, there, yeah, I can't really show that because it's under NDA. So um, I'll have to get those off the screen. So, okay, in the meantime, while the Arduino IDE is opening, it's still trying to open. All right, uh, back to comments. Uh, okay, so Andrew Brown asked, how long do you have before the solder paste goes off? That depends on the solder paste for, it's in the order of, like in, as a very hand wavy number, it's in the order of hours. So it wouldn't be a great idea to put the parts on and then uh, leave the board sitting on your bench and come back the next day and reflow it. It would probably work but it wouldn't be ideal because the carrier for the solder paste would have dried out, would evaporate, like the carrier would evaporate out of it. And uh, so, yeah, a few hours is fine. Uh, generally though, what happens is you end up putting the parts on, put it into the oven, and it might be on the board for you know 10 minutes or 
maybe half an hour before it goes into the reflow oven. That's pretty normal sort of time. Uh, okay, so I've just got to quit out of a few things here. And that's better. So now I can switch back to my desktop view. All right, you can't see anything that you shouldn't see. Link status, Mac address demo. All right, well, this actually, this is a, um, a reasonable thing to try. So what this is going to do, what this particular program will do, is talk to the MAC address ROM, which is at address um, hex 50, and it will read its value out. I'm just going to change that to 115200. Gets the MAC address, and it just outputs it onto the serial port. So I'm going to set the... Come on, just trying to open the tools menu. Uh, okay, I'm going to set the board to Arduino Uno because essentially that's what this should look like. And I've got to pick a port. The port is which one? Serial 14310. That would be it. So now I'm going to load the MAC address demo sketch onto it. <clears throat> Hang on, there's something weird going on here. I think, whoa. I think my board is not working properly. I do have some fail on it. That's interesting. So I was just powering it off USB and the part of the board has got warm. Hang on. I don't know what's going on with that. I think there might be a problem with the voltage regulator on it. So we might have some actual debugging to do. Should be interesting. Problem uploading to board. Yes, come on. Okay. Yeah, after the board has been running for a moment, it gets around the voltage regulator, it gets very hot. And which VREG is that? That is the five volt regulator that seems to be getting hot. I wonder if I've messed that up. That's the one that had the really dodgy solder joints on it. All right, so before getting too much further into this, what I'm going to do is try powering this off a bench supply. So I'm gonna stick, um, I'm gonna solder a socket onto it just for convenience. So I've got a, oh, what, how has the time gone? It's already 11.45. What happened? These things always take longer than you expect they will. All right, so I'm just gonna stick on a 2.1 mil socket. Normally I'd be turning on my fume extraction for doing this but uh, fume extraction is noisy. <laughs> a, lot of the, um, <clears throat> a lot of the things I do in here, I have noise cancelling headphones on while I'm doing it, so it's not great from a live stream point of view. Okay, lab power supply time. And let's see what's going on. I want a lead for DC jack, let's switch cameras so that you can see something a bit more useful than that. Uh, overhead. Okay, so that is the board currently plugged into the bench supply, which is currently turned off. And what am I going to set it to? I'll set it to 10 volts and I'll set it to 300 milliamps. Uh, and turn it on and it's Whoa, that is, I set, 0.3, enter. That is not happy. It's hitting the current limit, which suggests that there is a serious problem on that board. Interesting. There are many possible reasons for this. So I think what I would do next is try floating this back off. Take the, um, 
the five volt regulator back off it and see what happens when I'm powering with regulated five volts into the five volt rail at that point. All right, any other comments? Oh, wow, uh-huh. Yes, I didn't realize that I needed to scroll in here. I'm way behind on comments. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so Adam said a few weeks ago, um, I said I was considering revising the timing of the live stream. Have I had any further thoughts on this? My only thought on that is that I'm putting that decision off and I'm just sticking with the current timing for now. Uh, so James said, what is the bomb cost to add the micro SD card slot? The card holder itself is not particularly expensive. I think it's in the order of 50 cents US, give or take. And then there are a couple of other supporting parts because an SD card is an SPI interface and it needs the, it's 3.3 volt. SPI, which means we need voltage dividers. Uh, so we've got two resistor networks to do the voltage division for that. Um, so basically, the cost of adding the SD card is the cost of the carrier, which is 50 cents, plus a couple of supporting parts. So it's not all that much. Um, uh, yeah, so Station 240 said you can get 24 hour solder paste. Been meaning to get some myself for a board with 100 parts. Um, yeah, oh, Steve pointed out, do you have a thermal camera? Good for finding hotspots. I do, it's right here. That's a great idea. What I could do is power this up and see where the board gets hot. And then that is probably the problem. That is such an interesting thing to try that I think I'm going to do it right now. But uh, let's see, so Philip, said, have I had a look at the grid connector uh, Tyware 2S line of products from Bunnings? Yes, I have. I have some right here, which I bought for the purpose of pulling apart and um, showing, doing the, um, the reflashing to Tasmota. I just haven't done that yet. Uh, yeah, so, oh, and in relation to Station 240's thing about 24 hour solder paste, yeah, there are a few different types of solder paste. You can get solder paste that is called thermally stable, which means you don't need to keep it refrigerated. I have a little bar fridge in, so that door there, the white door, that goes through to a little bathroom. And you would have seen that if you saw the lab tour uh, a couple of live streams ago. And there is a bar fridge in there and I have a plastic container where I keep solder paste. So, um, this solder paste that I used is the, uh, this is not thermally stable solder paste. So the thing is that thermally stable solder paste doesn't, that doesn't mean that you can expose it to air for a long period of time. What that means is you don't need to store it in a fridge, although it is still better if you do. So there are a couple of different things. One is storage temperature so with different types of solder paste some you refrigerate some you don't need to and the other is its lifetime once you have put it onto the board before you reflow it and that's what that 24 hour solder paste is referring to so with that it's solder paste that you can put onto a board and you can you can leave it up 24 hours before it goes into a reflow oven and it should still perform properly with most solder paste it needs to be done within you know an hour a couple of hours so and if you've got a very large number of parts to place as station 240 said like a board with 100 parts on it it can take hours and hours to put all of those parts on by hand so having solder paste that you can leave exposed to the air for a long period of time is useful uh, um, all right so what was I going to do? That's right, thermal camera. Uh, let's see, I'm going to get thermal. I haven't used this camera for quite a while, so I'm going to see if this works and I'll switch to the proper view in a moment. But first I've got to find the camera. Where did I put it? Oh, there it is. All right, so now I need 
a cable for it. Here we go. And so camera is plugged in. Is it working? I can't tell. I have a feeling that this camera may need to be plugged directly into the computer instead of into the USB hub. There was some, oh no, there it is. There was some weird thing about it last time. Yeah, there we go. All right. Where's the board? Oh, I can't even see it because it's the same color as the background. All right, so now I'm gonna figure out a way to get this into a position where it can be seen. And then I'm gonna switch my view to showing my desktop, which is where the software for the thermal camera is coming up. Uh, now, when I've done this in the past, what I've done is used like a rubber band and attached this to, oh, let's see if I can do that again. I'll just do the same thing. Uh, grab myself a steel ruler and put a weight on it. What can I use as a weight? How about a roll of solder? That will do. And now I need a rubber band. This is really high tech, as you can tell. In fact, I'll get a couple of rubber bands. I'm gonna put one on there. And then attach this camera. with the rubber bands. Uh, come on. And slide it along. All right. Oh, that actually works out okay. All right, I'm gonna to switch to your view now. So at the moment I've got the thermal camera. In fact, let's Hang on, did I just see a super chat or something flash past? I'm going to show you how dodgy this setup is before we get into using it. Uh, camera, poker phone, let's see. Here we go. Hang on, has that stopped working? I think my poker phone has gone to sleep. Can I wake it up? Come on, come back. I might have to reconnect to the, hang on, I'm gonna switch you to the desktop while I screw around with the settings for the, oh no, I can't, I'm gonna switch to that in order to select that. Oh, I know why it'll have failed. It's because it'll have switched its Wi-Fi network. So one of the problems I have at the moment is I've got multiple Wi-Fi networks and if I'm not on the right network the camera doesn't work. Uh, come on. No? Okay. My droid cam is dead. I was wanting to show you the view 252. Yeah, deactivate, activate. No, droid cam has failed. So I'm gonna switch back to just using, okay, <laughs> the overhead view and desktop. All right, now can I make this bigger? What you're looking at here is the software for the thermal camera. And you might think that the purple patch at the bottom that you can see is the, uh, is the board that we're wanting to test, but it's not. That is actually just a reflection off one of the ceiling lights. And if I stick my hand in here, you'll see it come in looking very hot. So that's my finger. And this here is the, uh, the Ether Uno prototype. And if I get the angle right, you'll see a couple of bright spots appear on it. That's because those are metal parts. Like down here, we've got the SD card slot, 
which is silver. And if I move it at the right angle, it's acting as a mirror and the thermal camera is seeing the heat of the, in that case, I think it's the skylight. So I'll just move it like this and I'll plug in the power jack. So it's now, uh, I've moved my hand out of the way, which means that it's auto scaling. I'll just move my hand into it again. Yep. Oh well, the auto scaling will fix as soon as it gets hot. So I'm going to turn on the bench power supply and we'll see what happens. See if there's a hot spot. Oh look, there's a hot spot. You can see the two voltage regulators. That one, oh, and just beside the voltage regulator, what is going on there? I've got to find something to point with. That hot spot there, ah, oh, that is the diode. That's interesting. All right, so this is the voltage regulator. See that purple spot there on the right, the big one? I'm gonna put my finger over it. Mm. It's barely noticeably warm. Like with my finger, I'm having trouble telling that that is actually getting hot. But the thermal camera is sensitive enough that it picks it up. So let's have a look at the actual temperature. If I move the spot temperature over that point, it is 37, 38 degrees. Over the rest of the board, it's 23, 24 degrees. Around here, 24. Let's have a look on the diode. So on the diode, it's 40 degrees. Hmm, cool. Um, and if I, okay, I'm gonna try floating that diode off the board. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> Pancake Legend, yes, thank you for that super chat. That's, uh, that's very generous. So uh, James said, what thermal camera is that? It's a pure thermal lepton something, I can't remember. I bought it a couple of years ago from uh, Group Gets or somewhere like that. I'll look it up. In fact, I'll stick it on the gear page. The, um, uh, I'm gonna drop a link in um, oh, Electron Ash said diode backwards. No, I don't think that would prop, that would stop it. Uh, gear. All right, so I've just dropped a gear link into the chat. And what I'm gonna do is after the live stream, like sometime today, I will look up the, uh, the specs of the camera that I've got and I'll stick it on that gear page because it's actually a really useful tool. Great for things like this. Now, <laughs> I'm really thankful to, uh, to Steve for suggesting this because often I have this camera sitting here, like it's sitting right here on the shelf above me and I don't even think of using it, but it's great for this sort of purpose. So what that's done is narrowed down that there is a lot of heat being emitted around the voltage regulator and the diode. So there is possibly some problem with that. I've got a bench supply plugged into this and I've set the current limit to 300 milliamps which is enough that it's not, it's going to show up thermal issues like this, but it's not enough that it's gonna make smoke come out of the board, probably. So when you're bringing up a board like this for the first time, this is actually a really good idea, a good thing to do. Make sure it's plugged into a bench power supply and set the current limit to a sensible value. Uh, probably high enough that the board will power up if it's working properly, but not high enough that it's going to uh, it's going to go up in flames on your bench. All right, so that is very interesting to see. Well, uh, let's take that off. I'm going to switch back over to the overhead. Uh, where are we? Overhead view. Um, overhead view, and. Gonna move this out of the way. What I really need to do is make a proper mount for that thermal camera so I can put it into, ah, hang on. Let's look at myself. Woo! There's me on the thermal camera. And you can see the glasses. <laughs> thermal cameras are fun. Uh, so, I'm gonna turn off the bench supply and Unplug this. So what I'm gonna do first off is just 
flow off that diode. Now, if that diode was backwards, in theory it shouldn't have any effect. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Where's my hot air? There it is. For this one, I'm not going to bother using the preheater. I'm just going to butcher this. Chuck it on a piece of wood and warm it up. I'll start with the air a fair distance away so that it can warm it up uh, gradually and bring up that part of the board. It looks like I've got the hot air like right on the PCB, the view that you're getting from the camera, but it's actually a fair distance up above the PCB, warming up that whole area. So what I, my general technique for this is to warm up the area and then to move in and heat up the specific target part more. Oh, there it goes, it came off uh, more directly. And... Now that board is going to be stinking hot. Ah, let's chuck this back under the thermal camera before it really cools down. Oh look, we can see there's a hot spot. That whole part of the board that I heated up is now uh, very hot. <laughs> As you would expect. I'll just align it there. The camera is on a bit of an angle. Put my roll of solder back on here to hold it all in place. And uh, so now we can see how hot is that part of the board right now. So around there it is 90 degrees and falling. You probably have a bit of trouble seeing it in the, in the screen, but up in the top right here, there is a little temperature reading. And that is the spot temperature, which is where I've clicked the cursor into the image for the thermal camera. So 76, 75 degrees. So if I click around different parts of the board, that's 54 degrees, that's 46. Over here towards the corner, it'll be much cooler, 25 degrees. So it's only, you know, barely above room temperature over here on the side, up in the corner furthest away from where I just did the reflow. So, oh, this is quite spooky. I'm, what I'm gonna do is leave the cursor there and I'm not gonna move it. And you will see the hot area slowly shrinking away from the cursor. I think. Well, actually what's happening is that the, um, the camera or the camera software, I'm not sure if it happens in the software or in the camera, is adjusting its gain. And uh, you'll see that what happens is that it tries to adjust the gain so that whatever is the hottest part of the image is going to show up the brightest. So even though the temperature is falling, the general uh, pattern is kind of staying the same uh, until it all sort of evens out. But if we come down here now, that's only 50 degrees. And that was much higher than 50 degrees. Now it's 49 and falling. But you can see that what's happening is that it's evening out a little bit. Instead of being a very specific hot spot down here, the, the heat is sort of spreading across the board. So thermal cameras are cool. All right, let us try. Now we're not gonna be able to tell much from the thermal camera because it's preheated by that reflow. But what I'm gonna do is chuck the lab supply back in, turn it on, and I'm gonna see if it hits the current limit. And it doesn't. That is interesting. So it hasn't hit the current limit. Uh, it's, you know, in fact, it's not drawing any, oh, I know what. Okay, I was looking at the wrong diode. I thought this was the diode that I had just added and it wasn't. So this has led me on a bit of a wild goose chase. What's happened is the, there is something on the board that is short circuiting. It may end up being this regulator now. So the next thing is I'll float that off. But what's happening is that, oh, actually no. The actual short circuit is probably downstream of the five volt regulator. So what's happening is power comes in from the DC jack. It goes through that diode. From there, it goes into the input of the five volt regulator. And then 
that gets converted to 5 volts and then the output goes to the board. So somewhere on this board there is a short, I think, on the 5 volt rail. And that is what's causing the regulator to basically just draw as much power as it can. And that was then causing that protection diode to heat up. So right now I've got power plugged in. It's a bit hard to see on the thermal camera. Maybe I should switch back to the normal one. But we've got power coming in on the DC jack. And where are we? Overhead. Okay, so we've got power coming in on the DC jack and the diode, which was just there, was overheating because the output side of that diode, so the cathode, was going to the input of this, which is the 5 volt regulator. And presumably the 5 volt regulator was working its butt off trying to uh, provide power into a short circuit. So somewhere on this board, there is a short circuit on the 5 volt rail. That's my current conclusion. All right, so next thing I can do is try putting power onto the output of the regulator from the lab supply at five volts. And we'll see what happens. That'll bypass the lab supply entirely. Uh, that'll bypass the onboard regulator and tell us if the short circuit really is downstream of the regulator. So, which is the... Um, the pin for that, it is, okay, so five volts comes out of the tab and it goes, that is really weird. Where does it go? Ah, oh, there are a heap of vias there, or vias, however you want to pronounce it. Um, so where do they go? Sorry, you can't see what I'm looking at right now because I'm looking at how this is uh, at the connections for, oh, you can see it, but it's only small. So I'm looking for the connections on the five volt regulator. Now, if I switch back to desktop, so this is the footprint right here for the five volt regulator. And over here is the diode. So we've got five volts coming in on here from that DC jack goes through that diode heading from the anode side here through to the cathode and then that goes to the V in rail. V in goes onto the input of the 5 volt regulator and then the 5 volt regulator also has a ground connection and it has a 5 volt out. Now you can see from the part that's highlighted there is the tab of the regulator that connects through here goes to one of these capacitors and there are also a whole bunch of uh, vias. Now you can't really see them very easily on this view but like if I highlight one of them you'll see it. So ah, get rid of that. So there are there are a heap of where is it? I've got to highlight one. There. Okay. So there is one there, and there are, ro there are two rows of them down here to stitch the two sides of the PCB together. So the 5 volt output from this regulator goes down through all of those vias, and you can see this big blue area on the bottom. That is the, um, the 5 volt rail on the bottom of the PCB. And you can see that it comes through here. Unfortunately, it goes through a via to the top of the board comes up here, back to the bottom of the board again, which is really bad practice, but that's just the way it worked out on this board. And then it comes over here and the five volt rail is used for other things. So there could be a short in a few places. In fact, let's highlight the five volt uh, rail. So five volts is going to the AT Mega 16U2, which is the USB interface chip up here. There could be a short. Uh, for example, if there was a short here, between this five volt pin and the ground pin that is right next to it. That would explain this problem. And given that it's a QFN and I hate QFNs, I wanna blame that. But there are a few other places that it could be as well. So what I'm going to do first is just to verify that my theory is correct. I'm going to bypass the five volt regulator 
and feed 5 volts straight into it, into that header. Uh, now, where can I pick that up conveniently? It's on the tab, it's on, oh, okay, it's on the input side of this. Why didn't I just put a track across there? I've got no idea. That seems like a silly thing to have done. I could have directly connected the input of the 3.3 volt regulator across the top of the PCB to the output of the 5 volt regulator instead of relying on passing it down to the bottom of the board and then back up again. That's a silly move. All right, so this track here, this pad, is the 5 volt rail and ground is over here, which means I can very easily connect the lab supply onto the 3.3 volt regulator and use that to inject 5 volts and see what happens. So let's give that a shot. I'm going to switch off, switch away from that. And what I want instead of the, uh, no, these ones are big, horrible connections. Oh, well, on the lab supply, I'm going to switch away from that lead. I'm going to put in place a, oh no, those aren't going to work. I need different leads. Where are my other leads? These ones, no. I need uh, leads for the lab supply that have alligator clips on them. This one will do. And I need to set the power supply to five volts so I'm not injecting 12 volts onto the five volt rail, which would be really, really bad. Not the ideal thing to do. Now, these alligator clips are quite large and horrible. Uh, I'm kind of inclined to, yeah, that'll do. All right, so what I'm going to do is just connect, where will I do it? I'll find somewhere that I can connect ground. This one, that'll do. Ground can go on there. And then I'm just going to probe briefly anyway. This doesn't have to be particularly stable because I'm just going to touch this onto the uh, the input of the regulator. All right, so the lab supply is turned on. As a sanity check, I've got it set to five volts, 300 milliamps. Ground is connected and I'm going to feed five volts onto the input of the 3.3 volt regulator, which is the five volt rail. So let's see what happens. Okay, it is, well, you can see that the LED here comes on very briefly power LED. As I touch it, I don't know if you can see that on the camera. And what's happening is that it, the voltage briefly comes up. Like by briefly, I mean, it's probably milliseconds. And then the lab supply hits its current limit. So it's running at 300 milliamps right now. All right. So this is interesting because what we can do now is maybe use the thermal camera and see if we can this might help us to track down where the short circuit is. I'm going to get the whole board back under the thermal camera. I'm running way over time. I need to go and have lunch in a minute. Uh, what am I doing? Okay, so switching to... Switching to the thermal camera view and the desktop. And let's get this... Oh, come on. Has the thermal camera stopped working? First my mobile phone stopped working and now the thermal camera has stopped working. So I'm gonna quit out of get thermal, launch it again and see if it can see the camera. That's better. I even aligned it perfectly. Cool. All right, so now we have the board and you can see what looks like a hot spot. I don't think it is. There is a spot on the board just here. It's only 25 degrees. So this whole board looks like it's glowing hot now. It's not. That's because of the automatic gain control on the thermal camera. And the hottest parts of this board now are 25 degrees. It's like half a degree above ambient. And that'll just be some residual heat. So what I'm going to do now is touch the five volt input onto that point and we'll see if any part of the board gets hot. Um, 
Oh, look at that. There, that is getting hot. That is the voltage regulator. That's actually the five volt voltage regulator that got stinking hot when I applied five volts onto its output. That should not happen. That's a linear regulator, which is normally perfectly happy with, um, with having power applied to its output, like being back powered. So I have a suspicion that the problem is just that that regulator is balked. But then that's the one that I was messing around with earlier anyway. Remember I uh, got the soldering iron onto it and held it on for ages. I was just doing generally nasty things to it. So I'm going to flow that off the board and then do one final test. And then I think I'm going to have to end the live stream because I'm going to have to go and get lunch. But at least this way, hopefully we'll verify that that regulator is in fact the problem. So come back to here and let's hit it with some hot air. Now because now this is basically the worst part on the board to try to get off because uh, it's physically large. It's got a lot of, lot of large thermal mass and it has, that, um, it has that tab which it uses as a heat sink. So the way these are designed to be used is they use the PCB as part of their heat sink and that's one of the reasons that there are so many vias running down both sides of it to stitch the two sides of the board together. It's so that if the voltage regulator is trying to dissipate heat, that heat goes out through the vias to the bottom of the PCB. And there are like 30 or 40 vias right next to it. Oh, there it goes, it's come off. Which help to wick that heat down. In fact, you can probably see them if I chuck it under the microscope while the board is cooling down because I want to let the board cool down for a moment before I connect power again because if we use the thermal camera to see what's going on it's, um, it's no good if the board is still stinking hot from being reflowed. Uh, so you can see here the vias that are used for thermal and electrical stitching. This is the position where the voltage regulator is that I just pulled off and you can see there's a row of vias here, there's another one just inside it and then two rows over this side. And on the bottom of the PCB is a, hmm, actually something I'm noticing now, which is interesting. Uh, it's like there's a, um, the way this board is made, it's, there, uh, I don't know. Um, it looks weird to me. The, um, the solder mask here is different to the salt. Uh, no, they've done it on all the vias. That's okay. Um, you can see that there are these vias here and these vias here. It's like the solder mask is matte over the area of where the vias are and down here as well. Even though this is all one big piece of copper, it actually looks almost like that's a separate track, but it's not. It's just a weird artifact of the way this board has been manufactured. All right, so let's see if we still have a short circuit, even though the voltage regulator has been removed. Uh, overhead, yep. Yeah. All right, so let's do that same thing again. I'm gonna connect ground to this particular point, which is the ground point. And I'm gonna turn on the lab supply and just because it's a cool thing to do, I'm going to stick the thermal camera back on it. <laughs> this is horrible. I've got my little plastic container here with a ruler and a bit of a roll of solder as, uh, as physical ballast to try to hold it in place. I really need to make a proper mount for that thermal camera. Oh, is that running? Yes. Okay, so I'll switch you back to the thermal camera view. And... I'll drag that out, let it zoom. The resolution on the thermal camera is actually really low. It's, I can't remember what it is, but it's like 160 by 120 or something like that. But it's surprising how much information you can still get from a very low resolution image like this. All right, so 
lab supply is on and I am going to touch this to the 5 volt rail. Oh, look at this. Now the board runs. Um, the interesting thing is that you can't see it on the thermal camera. Those LEDs are blinking. Like blink is working on this. And I, um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny that you can't see it. The LEDs, the power LED, which is up in this corner, up there, is on. And the, uh, the D13 LED just below it is blinking. I can see it really super clearly with my eyes, but you can't see it on the thermal camera because the LEDs aren't getting hot. Um, now, you can see that there is a little patch warming up just there. Uh, to the right, you can see that little square that's starting to get warm. That's the ATmega328, so the microcontroller is getting very slightly above ambient temperature. Uh, now, that chip there, that is the WizNet chip, and it's getting warm. Now, it, it's actually not getting as hot as it looks because of that automatic gain control. That's probably only a couple of degrees above ambient. Um, but I think what this proves is that the voltage regulator that I stuck on this board was busted. So what I'm going to do uh, is grab a proper voltage regulator, a new one, <laughs> instead of a nasty one that I have ripped off another PCB, and I'm going to put that on it. Uh, okay. Oh, Electron said, on the cap to the left of the VREG pad, it looks like maybe a solder short to the ground plane. That's an interesting observation. I didn't see that. So I'm going to have a look at that. Maybe the problem was not with the voltage regulator itself, but with the capacitor to its left. Ah, yes, I see what Electron Ash is pointing out, but that is not the problem. Uh, yeah, that's a good observation, and that sort of thing can be a problem. Now, I'll see if I can point it out. So, now if, if you spotted this through this view, you've got good eyes, Electron Ash. The point of interest is right here. You see that little thing just next to the capacitor? Uh, in fact, I'm going to zoom right in and uh, see if we can see it a bit better. Where is it? About there. Might need some more illumination. Okay. What it looks like right there is potentially a short to the ground plane <clears throat> with a little stray bit of solder but and it's it's hard for you to tell through the camera but looking at this with my eyes i can see that that is not actually a problem i can flick that and the solder mask is unbroken the solder mask all through here is nice and clean you can see that there's a silver ring around it that's just light reflecting off it from the the ring light of the microscope but there is no i'll see if i can get the angle better there we go you can see that there's nothing there that's making contact. But that was a good observation. That could well have ended up being the problem. So thanks for pointing that out. No, I think the problem is just that the... Oh, Electron said, no, I was talking about the electrolytic, but I think it's just where the pad was soldered earlier. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, I'm... Going to, I'm really over time now. I thought that we'd have this all up and running and then I'd have done the tests on it by this point, but we didn't get that far, not in this live stream anyway. But uh, it is running, it's running blink now when um, I power it up from the external supply without the onboard voltage regulator. So yeah, I'm, I'm fairly confident that if I stick another regulator on to it, and not that super dodgy tarnished one that I pulled off a busted board. It could have been busted in the first place. That's the thing is, these donor boards <clears throat> that I've had sitting in a container and I've been pulling parts off, the reason they're sitting in that container is they were busted in the first place. So <laughs> there may well be uh, parts on them that are no good. And uh, with boards like that, usually 
pulling things, I normally do things like pull resistor networks off them and, you know, passives like inductors and other things that aren't very likely to be a problem. Uh, but sometimes things like voltage regulators or ICs, they could be the thing on the, the original board that was dead. Uh, so who knows, that board might have had a reverse voltage applied to it at some point or something happened that fried the regulator and that's what has now caused a problem here. Uh, so I'm in two minds now about whether I put another regulator onto this and try it. Um, do I? Don't I? I think I might. And try it before I end the live stream because you probably want to know whether it's working. Now I'm going to need, where do I get one from? I don't think I have one of those regulators new and the regulators have already been stripped off all of these other donor boards. Oh no, here's one. No, that one, that one's got a switch mode regulator on it. So, uh, hang on, I'm going to switch this camera to autofocus, even though autofocus drives me nuts. It's, um, it tends to hunt and seek on these Panasonic cameras. Uh, regulators, regulators, where do I get one? Regulators mount up. All right, I might have one. In fact, I probably do have one in my big box of random cut tapes. All right, if you're all sticking around and you feel like it, why not keep going? Just for another five or 10 minutes. I'm gonna find a voltage regulator. Oh, there's a 3.3 volt regulator. No, that's not the right one. LD1317 D-Pack, five volt. That is, that's the gold. That's what I want. So since we got this far, let's put another regulator on the board and see if it works. So brand new regulator, straight out of the tape. And if this now has the shorting problem again, then there is obviously something else weird going on. But uh, if this fixes the problem, then, well, I can get on with testing the other parts of the PC, like other functions of the board. But I won't do that right now on the live stream. I am just going to uh, get past this power problem and then hopefully that is, uh, that's it. Hopefully the rest of the board will work. But in any, in any case, I will stop and go and have lunch. Okay, so I've got a five volt regulator on there now. Uh, what will I do with that diode? Let's put the diode back on it because the diode was not the problem as it turned out. The diode was, uh, well, it was kind of a red herring, but it was, it was a symptom. It wasn't the cause. The diode was just doing its best to pass all the current that the voltage regulator was trying to consume, which was all of the current, every bit of it that it could get. So, hmm, it's an awkward spot to get to because these capacitors are in place. I could do this with, um, with hot air, but yeah, the iron is hot and it's right here. Come on, that's it. That's flowed. And I'll just solder the other end of this diode. Come on, get some solder in there. There we go, okay. So, hopefully we will now have great success. that out of the way, switch to the DC jack connections on the lab supply. I've got to switch the lab supply back from five volts. So I'll set that to, let's make it 10 volts again. Um, still set to 300 milliamps. Come to the overhead camera. Come on, where is my cursor? Got to find it on all these screens. There we go, okay, so. Now plug this in and 
I'll turn on the lap supply and we'll see if it hits the current limit. And it doesn't. Yes! Victory! Whoops. <laughs> I'm getting too excited, bashing the camera. All right, so <clears throat> because I have the thermal camera here set up and it's, um, it's kind of interesting to see, let's switch to the thermal camera and just watch it in normal use. So you can see now that the, uh, this part here, which is the WISNET chip, is starting to warm up. You can see that the voltage regulator down here is warm which will still be some residual heat because I just <laughs> had the soldering iron down in there. Now let's check the temperature. So the hottest part of it now is 37 degrees, 39 degrees. And it's jumping around a little bit, 40 degrees. It's slowly rising. So that is the temperature of the voltage regulator, which is now doing its job. So now we have a board that is working. It's running blink. And okay, one last thing. Just so that we get some success beyond Blink before we end the live stream. I'm going to switch back to the overhead view. Maybe it's out of here. Okay, so we now have, and you can see on this camera that Blink is working. So the little red LED there is flashing. So what I'm going to do next is try loading that sketch that I was trying to do before and I couldn't get it to load. Now uh, I will switch you back to desktop view in a second. Uh, what have we got? Uno, yeah we've got the serial port selected. So we're back to, okay so the Arduino IDE and what we're going to do is try uploading this sketch to it. Compile, compile, upload, upload. It's uploading. Is it going to work? Come on, you can do it. If this doesn't work, it's probably <laughs> a problem with that 16U2 USB to serial chip. Uh, so rather than diagnose that problem, what I could do is just put this in. Oh no, I can't do that. All right, that is... Let's even see if it's showing up. I'm just going to un... Oh, you know why? <laughs> I bet you're all shouting at me right now in the chat that I didn't plug in the USB. <laughs> and you would be right. <laughs> so I'm going to unplug <clears throat> that and plug USB into it. Okay, so now it is plugged into USB. And it is running blink. So I don't know what board I was just trying to upload that sketch to. I've got some other, <laughs> there is some other Arduino plugged into a, a device somewhere here that I was just trying to upload this sketch to. Uh, I think it actually might have been an ESP8266. All right, uh, compiling again and uploading. Come on, you can do it this time. Oh, yes, you can. No, I'm still not responding. Well, that's annoying. All right, I've got another problem to diagnose. I'm just checking my settings on here. So I've got, so it is an Uno. I've got the serial port selected and etc. cetera. Um, uh, I have a feeling that I may have pulled this processor off. Now, what did I get it from? I pulled this processor off some donor board that may not have even had a 16U2 as it's serious speed of serial converter. So, I may just need to reflash the bootloader onto it um, so that it will talk properly to the 16U2. Uh, but this is kind of getting into fiddly territory. Uh, first, though, I'm going to verify that I do have the correct serial port selected. So, under tools, port 14. 3401. I'm going to unplug that and check my serial port list again and that port is gone. So it is definitely port 14 for where was it? No, it's not back yet. Come on. Give me a uh, there it is. 14 3401. 
All right. Oh, Jerry L42. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the, the super chat. Um, now, let's see. Compiling. <clears throat> let's see what happens. Do we get anything uploading? No, this is going to fail. So, <clears throat> oh, excuse me a second. Okay. <clears throat> it's definitely time for me to stop the live stream. All right, so we diagnosed the power supply problem. And I think that uh, that is probably okay. So this problem with uploading a sketch to it is probably <coughs> related to the 16U2 USB to serial chip. <coughs> so, <coughs> um, okay, I'm not going to do this now on the live stream. I need to finish this and go and have lunch. But just to tell you what I will do from a diagnosis point of view to actually get past this next stage is I will connect an ICSP programmer to the board and I will reflash the bootloader onto the AT Mega because it could be that this one that I pulled off the old donor board is so old that it's got one of the really old bootloaders on it from back when we were using the FT232 RL USB to serial chip. So we we're using that old, old thing way back before uh, switching to the 16U2 and so that will at least verify that the processor is working properly. Um, then I will test again, obviously. If that doesn't work, what I will do is get a USB to serial converter module. So I've got uh, things like, let's switch this back to here. Um, so I've got things like this um, USB to serial converter. And this has got a 16U2 on it as well. So what I'll do is connect the data pins from this onto the data pins on the target board. Essentially, I will bypass the onboard 16U2 and see if I can talk to it using this. If I can, that indicates that the problem with communication is with that part of the circuit. So it's with the 16U2. Now that part of the circuit hasn't actually changed since the previous prototype. It's the exact same USB to serial converter that was on the previous revision, that part of the board hasn't changed. So if that is not working, it's probably just an assembly problem. In which case, if I just hit the 16U2 with some hot air and maybe some flux and wiggle it around a little bit, get it to reflow and reseat, it'll probably start working. Uh, and it may be necessary to replace it. Because once again, I pulled that 16U2 off another donor board and <laughs> I'm being kind of silly just pulling these dodgy old parts off. What I should be doing is using new parts that I know are okay. So if, that's a, if that continues to be a problem, I'll just replace it with a new part, which I do have somewhere here in a drawer somewhere. And that will, should get USB to serial con, uh, working. I'm confident that I can do that. So I'm not gonna bother going through all of that right now on the live stream and keep you hanging on for another half hour while I mess around with it. Then after that, what I will do is test that the, um, I'll get back to this test I was just trying to run, which is that the MAC address chip works. Once again, that part of the circuit hasn't changed, so that should be okay. Then it gets to the interesting stuff, which is testing the WizNet chip. And that is really where the major change has happened with this revision of the PCB, because I added those bias resistors to the mode pins and uh, so I need to make sure that's working and there were a couple of other little hacks to do with the way the data pins were connected that I changed and I, um, I manually patched them on the previous prototype and then applied those changes to this one. So at that point, and there are other things like the SD card I'll need to test. There are a few just general things to test. But anyway, you can see how the process is going. Once I fix the USB to serial, it's all just a matter of working through each of these things one step at a time and taking it carefully enough that hopefully I don't blow up the board in the process. So 
Um, oh, Frank, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, for that $20 super chat. ESP flasher. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, where is it? Where is it? Here. ESP flasher is complete. So that's the ESP flasher. And that's the ESP flasher adapter. Uh, not the greatest camera to be showing you this on. But this gives the 1x6 uh, 0.1 inch format header. Plug it into this and now it's got uh, 2x3 uh, IDC headers in both 1.27mm and 2.54mm. And also down the bottom it's not populated. 1x6 in 1.27mm. So I've been using this with the tiny little 1.27mm pitch uh, IDC cables on, uh, on a few projects now. Over the last two weeks I've brought up several new boards with this connector on it and use this programmer and it works brilliantly. So yeah, it's really cool having a board with an IDC header for the programming uh, connection because it means that you don't have this plugged into it and then a bulky USB cable that sort of drags the board around on the bench and it's not very convenient. Using this combination um, I actually really like this. So 2x3 IDC header, 1.27mm pitch, so the whole thing is very, very small. You just have this sitting on your bench, plug this into your target board, and then you can do reflashing. So that is working out really well. Oh, Sion, <laughs> thanks for, run, uh, for hanging around. And uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you everyone else for hanging in. So, oh yeah, so Frank said, in the shop yet? Uh, yes, I think so. I kind of, let me just check. Uh, I did a, uh, hmm, ESPF, I think that URL will get you there. Um, I've been kind of low-key about it because, uh, I still need to do more documentation and other things in relation to it. So ESPF, that is where to find it. And I also need to still put up the flasher adapter, which is a little add-on board that gives you all of the other breakouts. Uh, okay. Um, one final thing. So. Um, Sharon AP said, which software are you using for PCB designing? And I'm using Eagle primarily at the moment. That's my main thing. But I'm going to bail now because I have run super overtime. What? It's heading towards three hours. It's two hours, 45 minutes so far. Ah, long, long time. Lunch time. <laughs> I'm getting messages in the back channel from Andy saying, lunch time in bold and like with arrows towards it. So uh, I'm gonna go now, but thank you all very much for coming along to another live stream. I'm gonna get this board going off stream and report back in Discord on the results. So if you wanna hear more about this, make sure you join the Discord. And I am going to hit end. Thanks to everybody. And I will talk to you soon. Okay, have a great weekend. Bye. Oh, the voice from beyond. Uh, John Nelson asked, I may have missed it. Did you add that crystal? The answer is no, I haven't added it yet. I need to do that before I can test US, uh, before I can test Ethernet. Bye bye.